You are listening to the Intrepid Radio Program with Scotty Roberts. Intelligent Talk. No guns, no walls, no hatefulness. Just a victory dance, I'll never taste defeat. Where there's nothing done, I said that can't be forgiven. Every step you take is on sacred ground. Well, happy Friday. It's finally here, folks. Thanks for being here. This is Scotty Roberts. You're listening to the Intrepid Radio Program right here on Odyssey Radio Network. And that's O-D-Y-S-Y 1.com if you want to go hear the live audio as it broadcasts out to the network and all the terrestrial stations, iHeartRadio, places like that. Or you can also come in and Watch the video over on my YouTube stream, which is being simulcast, and that video is at youtube.com slash Mr. Scotty Roberts, Mr. All Spelled Out. I want to thank you for being here, and uh, yeah, I like Fridays just as much as anybody else. The problem is, I work for myself, so I don't get to go home from work. Work is always here, so I tend to work a lot on the weekends and get stuff done. Um, So, uh, Friday is always different for me. The only nice thing about Friday is generally it's the end of the week of getting lots of calls and things like that. So, Friday's good for me, just as it's good for you. Glad you're here. You know, we've been awfully serious and awfully emotional over the last week with this series I've been doing on the Ghost Dance and Wavoka and Wounded Knee and the oppression, the conquering of the American West, which, by the way, this story that took us five days to just hit as lightly as we possibly could historically is only one of hundreds of stories about the 1850s to the 1890s and the subjugation of the American people, Native American peoples. And so what you've got is just a smattering of what's out there. And I cannot say I will not visit this topic again, uh, as uh, there's so many more stories to tell. And I think it's a part of our history that has been forgotten. Uh, In most, I'm saying in the majority, it's been forgotten. It's certainly not forgotten amongst Native Americans and those who are students of history of the United States of America. So I'm going to end this little series tonight by talking about, we've already talked about Wounded Knee in the past. What about Wounded Knee in the present? There was something that happened in the 1970s that happened at Wounded Knee, which brought Wounded Knee once again into the forefront of the Native American culture and Native American history now. And so I want to go into that topic a little bit and kind of tell you what happened. And if those of you who are as old as me, I'm in my late 50s, if you remember this, uh, you know, I was a young teen in in, in middle school when uh, the 1973 standoff at Wounded Knee took place. And it it was with such uh, noted people that, you know, I've got a few pictures I'm going to show you tonight. Let's start with a couple here. And, And those of you listening on radio, you don't get a chance to see these. But uh, I'll describe them as best I can. Some are just some of the personalities that were involved in this. I want you to take a look, folks, at this picture. This is Russell Means. Now, you may recognize him. He's been in a few movies. Uh, Most notably, he was in, I think it was 1992, when uh, Daniel Day-Lewis did uh, Last of the Mohicans. It was Russell Means here in this picture that portrayed Chunguchkuk, the uh, his stepfather, his Native American father, of uh, Natty Bumpo in the in the series, I'm sorry, in the movie, and so you might recognize his face because he's been in a couple of movies, but he was also uh, one of the founders of the American Indian movement and a great uh, Native American activist. There was also at uh, Wounded Knee in 1973 this fellow by the name of Dennis Banks. Now, Dennis Banks is still alive today. He's an old, older man now. Uh, Russell Means died in 2012. 
But uh, you can see uh, these guys. This is uh, who they are. This is how they looked back then uh, during the standoff. And uh, we're going to talk about these guys a little bit and tell you a little bit about why they were doing what they were doing, why Wounded Knee in 1973 took place. And maybe the best way to do that is to remember what took place at Wounded Knee just by way of recap for a few minutes here. Let's recap what we've talked about this last week. And uh, I want to show you one more picture. I do believe I have it in my lineup here uh, of the uh, uh, the wounded, wounded Knee as it was depicted back in the day. And let's see if I've got it. No, I don't have it. Um, I took that one out. But I want to show you a couple of other pictures. This picture right here, after the massacre in 1890, this shows you a wagon uh, with some of the soldiers and civilians that were there almost three weeks after what they called the Battle of Wounded Knee. There was no battle there. Uh, there was a massacre there. Now, yes, there was some fighting back from some of the Native Americans who did not intend to fight. They were there to do the peaceful ghost dance. But this shows you how after the blizzard had cleared, and they went out and they gathered up all the bodies. And uh, here, this next picture, is the mass grave where they buried them. And you can see um, how they dug the big, long, oblong pit, and they buried them all in, uh, without much pomp and ceremony, into a common grave. Now, that site still exists today. Um you can see it, folks, if you're here on the uh, U YouTube stream. Uh, those of you on radio, these are just some of the old uh, tin-type photos. And they might have been glass photos um, of what was taking place uh, in the few weeks after the massacre at Wounded Knee. And so, I got a couple of more pictures I want to show you here, folks. Um, remember in the story, there was the medicine man who came out when they started collecting guns from the, the Native Americans at Wounded Knee. And he came out and he started doing a few steps of the ghost dance, started singing. He was urging the people to, uh, you're going to be fine. He says, the shirts that you wear with the magic talismans on them, these will protect you if they start shooting at us. Well, the medicine man was, was found like this. This is a picture of him uh, where he died. Uh, he had his hands up, uh, grasping toward his head or had fallen backwards. Now, you see the rifle that is right next to him? That was not his rifle. That was placed there by the soldiers for the photograph. So, this is the medicine man who tried to start the dance when things started getting out of hand. And uh, uh, there are so many pictures that I did have up and that I put up. This, by the way, is one of the... Remember we talked about the Hotchkiss guns? Here's some of the U.S. military that were on the site with this gun. They had four of them by the time the seventh arrived. Uh, and this gun could fire up to two miles distance. Uh, and it had explosive with shrapnel. And uh, they used these guns while the army was shooting at everyone as well. And uh, then... As a final picture, I'm going to show you one where they started gathering up souvenirs. This is a few weeks after the incident. Might even This one might have been the next day after the blizzard had cleared. And the soldiers, you can see, they're holding... The guy on the left is holding, I think, a tomahawk. Uh, and some of the other soldiers are going through the Native American corpses that they had just mown down the day before or a couple of days before, and they're pulling off souvenirs. And some of these same men were the men that were given uh, medals of honor. Some of them uh, were, uh, 20 of them, were awarded by the U.S. government for their part in the Battle of Wounded Knee. And now, as I mentioned yesterday, there's also legislation going today that would hopefully rescind those medals uh, uh in, in retrospect, now that the history has been looked at better. So, 
I don't know what you think of that. Maybe you have an opinion about that. Should those men, those soldiers, uh, be allowed posthumously, their families, any descendants they have, be allowed to keep those honors? Or should those honors be stripped away? I don't think there was anything honorable about the U.S. Cavalry's actions that day. So uh, there is some of the some of the pictures, and I'm going to show up, flash up one more uh, while I start to talk about this. There was a memorial that was built. Now, some of you may have seen a depiction of this memorial. I don't recall if the movie was actually filmed on the site. I think it was. But if you remember, there was a Val Kilmer movie that came out about 20 years ago. Graham Greene was in it. Uh, Graham Greene was the uh, very well-known Native American actor who played uh, the medicine man Kicking Bird in Dances with Wolves. Well, he was in this movie as a tribal sheriff. And this movie kind of focused on some of the uh, current day um, what did you call? What would you call it? And sorry for all the ums. I'm thinking as I'm talking. It was the current day attempts to rescind treaty rights because of resources found on Native American land. And this movie is supposed to take place in the '70s. It was a movie called Thunderheart. Now, if you have not seen that movie, I would recommend picking it up. It's a good movie. Uh, Val Kilmer plays a, an FBI agent in it. And they're searching for a guy, and it, and it's all pretty straightforward out of out of history with with different names, and uh, they're trying to solve a murder that took place on the uh, uh, reservation, and he is also what they refer to as a half breed. Uh, he's part Native American, which he tries to deny even exists in him at the beginning of the movie. But there are some scenes that take place at Wounded Knee. Uh, at least depictions of wound, wounded knee, and uh, I think that this is uh, this would be a good movie to watch. It'd be excellent, but this is a a picture of the wounded knee memorial, and here is how it looks. Uh, this is the approach to it. Right here, it's up on a knoll at the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota. That's the gate, front gate to the memorial, right there. And this memorial is built where, remember when I showed you the picture a few minutes ago of the long common grave? That long common grave is inside those gates. And today, uh, well, this, this is what the, uh, the, the memorial looked like up close. And if you can see, it's on Pine Ridge, which is one of the poorest reservations and one of the poorest places in the country. And behind those gates, inside the main gate, is the long trench that was dug with the common grave. And there was a marker that's put up at the end, and I'll show you a picture of that as well. Now, you can see it's in disrepair here over the years. There was just no money to do anything with it. And outside restoration efforts came in, and uh, it now looks like this, where they've taken some of those broken up steps and they poured some new concrete and things like that. And here is the marker that is inside at the head of the trench, and on this marker, you see it overlooks the, the place where this took place at Wounded Knee. This is the marker. And then I want to show you uh, one more picture here. This is a close-up of the marker. This doesn't, by any means, give you everything that is on this marker. But you can see uh, they've got the date on there of uh, December 29th of 1890 at the top and they start to list and you see the names we're at number 23 at the top on this side of the monument but names like spotted thunder shoots the bear picked a horses bear cuts and there's something that's obscured there by some memorials hung there chase in woods um tooth is something red horn he eagle uh, no fears, no ears, I think that says. And so you see some of the names on that marker. That's there at Wounded Knee. So these are some of the attempts that were made by the reservation to memorialize those who died there in that massacre. And so let's get into a little bit. That's some of the history. I'm going to recap some of the history just for a few minutes here. And that might take us up till we have to go out, and then we'll jump into 
what happened in 1973, but the massacre that took place was on December 29th of 1890. It was a massacre of Sioux warriors, of women, of children, and it happened along the, the Wounded Knee Creek in southwestern South Dakota. And it marked really, as we've mentioned already, the final chapter in the long war between the United States and the Native American tribes that were indigenous to the Great Plains of this country. And for the entirety of his 27 years, Black Elk's somber eyes had watched as the way of his life for his fellow Lakota Sioux withered on the Great Plains. The medicine man had witnessed a generation of broken treaties, shattered dreams. Uh, he watched as the white men of the United States government came in like a river, quote-unquote, after gold was discovered in the, in the Dakota Territory Black Hills in 1874. Imagine what that did to the treaty rights. And he had been there two years later when Custer and his men were annihilated at the Little Bighorn. Uh, he had seen the Lakota's traditional hunting grounds evaporate as white men dis decimated the native buffalo population. And remember, we talked about this this week, one of the goals behind that, they opened the plains to buffalo hunting, and it was really for the great purpose of having the thrill of a buffalo hunt, but at the same time, taking away the wild herds that fed the Native American tribes on the plains. And they were all pretty much refined to government reservations after this point. And life for the Sioux was as bleak as the weather that gripped the snow-dusted prairies of South Dakota in the winter of, 19, of 1890. And a glimmer of hope had risen this is what we talked about all, all week. There was this glimmer of hope that rose with the ghost dance, with the words of Wavoka, who claimed to be a reincarnate Christ, bringing this message to the people. Um, and this ghost dance movement preached that Native Americans had been confined to reservations because they had angered the gods by abandoning their traditional customs. So there was also shame that was brought with it within their own ranks. And leaders promised that the buffalo would return, relatives would be resurrected, and the white man would be cast away if the Native Americans performed a ritual ghost dance. And you know, it's interesting, there was no money in it. Nobody was, there was no scam behind it or scheme. Give us your money and dance the dance, and your relatives will be revived. And you know, there was nothing like that. So this was all on a very spiritual level. And as the movement began to spread, the white settlers in the area grew really increasingly alarmed. They feared it was a prelude to an armed uprising. Um, Indians are dancing in the snow and are wild and crazy, telegrammed a frightened government, government agent that was stationed on South Dakota's Pine Ridge Reservation. He sent that to the Commissioner of Indian Affairs on November 15th of 1890. He said, we need protection and we need it now. And so General Nelson Miles arrived, arrived on the prairie with 5,000 troops as part of the 7th Cavalry. And that was Custer's old command and ordered the arrest of several Sioux leaders. And uh, amongst them were, if you remember this week, we talked about Sitting Bull, uh, who was mistakenly believed to have been joining the Ghost Dancers. Now, remember, his attitude toward it was, eh, not my thing. He says, I don't think there's anything to it. But if they want to do it, I'm, I'm here. I'll support them. They're my people. And uh, on December 28th, the cavalry caught up with Chief Bigfoot, who was leading a band of upwards of 350 people to join Chief Red Cloud near the banks of Wounded Knee Creek, which winds through the prairies and the badlands of southwest Dakota. And the American forces arrested Bigfoot, too ill with pneumonia to sit up, let alone walk. And they positioned their Hodgkiss guns on a rise overlooking the Lakota camp. And as a bugle blared the following morning, December 29th, the American soldiers mounted their horses, surrounded the Native American camp. A medicine man whose picture we saw dead in the snow 
started to perform the ghost dance, and he cried out, Do not fear, but let your hearts be strong. Many soldiers are about us and have many bullets, but I am assured their bullets cannot penetrate us. And he implored the heavens to scatter the soldiers like dust that he threw up into the air as he was dancing. And the cavalry, however, went teepee to teepee, seizing axes, rifles, other weapons, and as the soldiers attempted to confiscate a weapon, they spotted under a blanket of a deaf man who could not hear their orders, a gunshot suddenly rang out. Now you can see by this account that there are discrepancies in the accounts. They didn't find it under a blanket. He came out, Black Coyote, and he raised that rifle in the air. He was a deaf man, but he was also wild at heart, they say of him. And he raised it up and he said, This is my gun. Don't take it. I paid lots of money for it. I'm going to put it down. And he was speaking in Lakota. And uh, as they were trying to wrest that gun from him, a fire uh, or a, a gunshot rang out. And then all hell broke loose. Uh, bullets, rifles, uh, a hail of rapid fire, the Hodgkins guns into the teepees. They outnumbered, outgunned, and the Lakotas offered just a, a very meek resistance to this. All their guns were laying in a pile. And they had a few things that they were able to pull out. And Bigfoot, the chief, was shot where he was sitting on the ground. And... And boys who only moments before were playing leapfrog were mowed down. And in just a matter of minutes, at least 150 Sioux, some historians put the number twice that high, nearly 300, were killed along with 25 American soldiers. Nearly half of the victims were women and children, and the American soldiers, many of them, died from friendly fire. If you remember the drawings I showed you, the Indian pictographs, they were in the center and the soldiers were all around them in a circle. And so from that circle, when they're all firing in, they killed some of their own. And so several days later, a burial party uh, dug a big pit and dumped all the frozen bodies in. And for decades, survivors of the massacre lobbied in vain for compensation, while the U.S. Army was awarded 20 Medals of Honor to members of the 7th Cavalry for their roles in the bloodbath. And remember, the 7th Cavalry was Custer's was was Custer's unit. And so I think that there was some revenge in that as well, and they awarded them the Medals of Honor. And when Black Elk closed his eyes in 1931, he could still envision the horror. When I look back now from this high hill of my old age, he told writer John G. Uh, Nehart for his 1930 book, Black Elk Speaks, which you can still buy today, I can still see the butchered women and children lying heaped and scattered all along the crooked gulch as plain as when I saw them with eyes still young. And I can see that something else died there in the bloody mud and was buried in the blizzard. A people's dream died there. But this wasn't the last time that blood flowed next to Wounded Knee Creek. In February of 1973, activists with the American Indian Movement, seized and occupied the site for 71 days. This was back in 1973. To protest the U.S. government's main uh, mistreatment of Native Americans. And the standoff standoff resulted in the deaths of two Native Americans. Not 300, thank goodness. We're going to get into this now, and I'll tell you what happened at Wounded Knee in 1973. But you stay tuned. I got to go out for two minutes. I'll be right back. Sit tight.
All right, folks, we're back. Thanks for uh, hanging on during the break. I'm so glad you're here. This is Scotty Roberts. You're listening to the Intrepid Radio Program right here on Odyssey Radio Network. That is odyssey1.com, O-D-Y-S-Y-1.com. That's where you can go hear the audio version of this show that broadcasts, broadcasts out over the nation. And you can also go to my YouTube channel, my live stream, to watch the simulcast video and join in the live chat room. And that is at youtube.com slash Mr. Scotty Roberts. And uh, while you're there, go ahead and subscribe. And then hit the little bell for like and you'll get uh, notifications every time uh, that this broadcast goes up. So we were talking about something, and I want to make a correction first. I think in the first hour I had mentioned that Black Elk, for all his 27 years, um, uh, that was a uh, typo in my own notes. He lived to be 87 years old. He was born in 1863, and he died in 1950. And his was the quote we read right at the end of uh, the first segment. So one little correction there from the first hour, the first segment. So let's dig into this a little bit more now. What happened at Wounded Knee in 1973? Remember that this was a place, it was sacred ground. This is a place where Native Americans were massacred, and it was really considered to be the last nail in the coffin to the Plains Indians as the United States government moved in and clamped them down as a conquered people. So, I want to uh, get back into this story of Wounded Knee and what happened there. Let me call up my uh, my notes here as we look at this. Uh, so, yeah, this isn't all just straight out of my head. So, looking at what happened, there was... I've got an old article pulled up here, too. Uh, It's from uh, 2012. And this is an article that was written the day after Russell Means died. And uh, remember Russell Means, I showed you his picture at the beginning. He was part of the 71-day siege at Wounded Knee in 1973, and he'd been in movies, so we recognized uh, who he was. He was a Native American activist. And... uh, This article is entitled, A 71-Day Siege and a Forgotten Civil Rights Movement. And it was written by Emily Shertoff on October of 2012. And um, on February uh, 27th of 1973, a team of 200 Oglala, or Lakota Sioux, activists and members of the Native uh, American Indian Movement They seized control of this tiny town of Wounded Knee, South Dakota, which is on the Pine Ridge Reservation. Uh, It's a town that had a, as you can tell from this last week, a loaded history. And they came in and they arrived in, in town at night in a caravan of cars, trucks. They took the town's residents hostage. They demanded that the U.S. government make good on treaties from the 19th and early 20th century. And within hours, the police had surrounded Wounded Knee. They formed a a cordon to prevent protesters from exiting and sympathizers from entering. And this marked the beginning of a 71-day siege and an armed conflict. And Russell Means, one of uh, AIM's leaders, AIM, the American Indian Movement, when this article was written, had just died. He died back in 2012. He was a controversial figure within the movement and outside of it. And his New York Times obituary put it this way, quote, Critics, including many Indians, called him a tireless self-promoter who capitalized on his angry rebel notoriety, end quote. And after getting his start in activism in the 1970s, Means went on to run for the Libertarian presidential nomination in 1987. I'll bet you don't remember that. And for governor of New Mexico in 2002. He also acted in scores of films, most famously in a lead role in the 1992 version of The Last of the Mohicans. He played Chinguchkuk, 
which was uh, Nettie Bumpo, uh, Daniel Day-Lewis, uh, his Native American father. And for all the contradictions of his life, Means was no less controversial than AIM itself. The Wounded Knee Siege was both an inspiration to indigenous people and to left-wing activists around the country. According to the U.S. Marshals Service, which besieged the town along with the FBI and the National Guard, the longest-lasting civil disorder in 200 years of U.S. history. Two Native activists lost their lives in the conflict, and a federal agent was shot and paralyzed. Now, like the Black Panthers or the MECHA, AIM was a militant civil rights identity movement that sprung from the political and social crisis of the late 1960s, on the heels of Martin Luther King. But today, it's more obscure than the latter two groups. The Pine Ridge Reservation, where Wounded Knee was located, had been in turmoil for years. Uh, too many in the area, the siege, to, to many in the area, the siege was no surprise that it happened. The Oglala Lakota, who lived on the reservation, faced racism beyond its boundaries, and there was a poorly managed tribal government within them. And in particular, they sought the removal of tribal chairman Dick Wilson, whom many Oglala lived, uh, living on the reservation thought incredibly corrupt. And they were probably right. Uh, Oglala Lakota, interviewed by PBS for a documentary, said Wilson seemed to favor mixed race, assimilated Lakota like himself, and especially his own family members, over reservation residents with more traditional lifestyles. And efforts to remove Wilson by impeaching him had failed, and so the Oglala local uh, Lakota li tribal leaders turned to AIM, the American Indian Movement, for help in removing him by force, and their answer was to occupy Wounded Knee. Now, uh, I am going to uh, show you a photo, and again, uh, sorry those of you on the radio, you're not going to be able to see these, but you can come over anytime and come and take a look at these. I'm going to show you just some pictures from the occupation of Wounded Knee back in 1973. Here you see Russell Means, he's in the plaid jacket, uh, kind of uh, in, the, in the middle ground there, leading the walkers, and uh, that's Russell Means, and uh, you see some of the other agency officials there, and you see some of the people, and some on horseback, they're all coming up the road, and they're riding in to Wounded Knee, and uh, this, is, this is some of what you saw in the day, and I'm going to show you a few more pictures. Uh, there's the little schoolhouse, the church at uh, Wounded Knee. And uh, there you see the activists are gathering. You see that there are guns. Some people have guns. Uh, here they are, uh, all in front of the, the little trading post in Wounded Knee. They're sitting all over the roof, all down the front. You can see um, Dennis Banks is in here. Russell Means is in this crowd. And this is an old black and white picture from 1973. Uh, we did have color film back then, folks. I'm not that old. Uh, but... Uh, uh, this was from uh, a newspaper shot. Um, these are just a couple of the Lakota with arms out front of the small church where they were holed up. And uh, here you see uh, uh, Russell Means on the left, and they're reading off some of their demands. And in the background you see the territory of Wounded Knee, the area. And uh, here are just some of the guys that are hanging out that uh, also have their guns. These are the Native Americans that stood uh, with AIM and against um, Wilson and were trying to have him ousted. And they made it an occasion to be able to bring up other demands. And so let, let, let's, let's go a little bit deeper into this. The federal marshals and the National Guard traded heavy fire every day with the Native American activists. And to break the siege, they cut off electricity and water to the town. And they attempted to prevent food and ammunition from being passed to the occupiers. And so they were trying to, in a way, they were laying siege, just as in olden days. Cut off the water, cut off the food supply. Pretty soon they're going to have to give up. And Bill Zimmerman, who was a sympathetic activist 
and a pilot from Boston agreed to carry out a 2,000-pound food drop on the 50th day of the siege. And when the occupiers ran out of the buildings where they had been sheltered to grab the supplies, U.S. agents opened fire on them. And the first member of the occupation to die, a Cherokee, was shot by a bullet that flew through the wall of a church. I want to tell you something, too. There's a little story I have. If Some of you remember uh, Rainy and I were buying a little horse ranch back uh, 10 years ago. And I had known the old cowboy from uh, Wyoming uh, who was selling the place to us. Uh, he kind of talked like this. You know, he was from out there. He was an old rodeo guy. And uh, he told me a story once. He says, you remember that uh, wounded knee standoff back in the 70s? And I told him I did. And he said, I'm not going to tell you any names. He says, but there was a bunch of ranchers who got together and at night drove several head of cattle into the area of Wounded Knee and into the compound there so the Native Americans could have some meat and food. And uh, I said, were you one of those guys? And he said, I can't tell you. Now, he passed away, this friend of mine, uh, a few years back. And his widow told me, in talking to her, that just uh, after his death even, they came knocking on his door, the federal government. Now, this is how many years later? 73? This is over 40 years later. They came knocking to see if uh, her husband was still around. They wanted to question him about the wounded knee standoff back in 1973. And she said, I'm sorry, he's passed on. And so uh, um, there were a lot of people that were sympathetic with these guys. And if you note, the first death was on day 50 when somebody was shot while trying to retrieve food that was dropped into them. And they were not killing people. They had a standoff. They were making demands. And so to many observers, um, the standoff resembled the Wounded Knee Massacre of 1890 itself, when a U.S. cavalry detachment slaughtered a group of Lakota warriors who refused to disarm. And some of the protesters also had a more current conflict in mind, as one former member of AIM told PBS, quote, they were shooting machine gun fire at us, tracers coming at us at nighttime, just like a war zone. We had some Vietnam vets with us, and they said, man, this is just like Vietnam. End quote. When PBS interviewed the federal officials later, they said that the first death in the conflict inspired them to work harder to bring it to a close. Now, the death that they caused, they're shooting people who are just holed up. They're not threatening to kill anybody. They hadn't killed anybody. They had their weapons for their own defense so they could hold the standoff. So obviously there's more than one side to this and how this looks. But the first ones to, to kill anybody were the U.S. agents. And so for the Oglola, uh, the Oglola Lakota, the death of tribal member Buddy Lamont on April 26th was the critical moment. While members of AIM fought to keep the occupation going, the Oglala overruled them. And from that point, negotiations began between the federal agents and the protesters, and it began in earnest. They wanted to bring this to a close. The militants officially surrendered on May 8th, and a number of members of AIM managed to escape the town before being arrested. Those who were arrested, including Russell Means, were almost all acquitted because key evidence was mishandled. And even after the siege ended... A quiet war between Dick Wilson and the traditional pro-AIM faction of Oglala Lakota continued on the reservation. And despite this was all despite Wilson's re-election to the tribal presidency in 1974. So in the three years following the standoff, which really was sparked by his, his being in office and his corruption, he was re-elected, and Pine Ridge had the highest per capita murder rate in the country. Now we're talking per capita, not in numbers, in percentages. Two FBI agents were among the dead. 
The Oglala blamed... Now, this didn't happen at Wounded Knee. This was the uh, Leonard Peltier case, which happened later. But the Oglala blamed the federal government for failing to remove Wilson as tribal chairman. Uh, the U.S. retorted that it would be illegal for them to do so, somewhat ironically citing reasons of tribal self-determination. So, you know, they were playing both sides of that fiddle. That's what they were doing. So today, current day, the Pine Ridge Reservation is the largest community in what may be the poorest country in county, I'm sorry, in the United States. And per capita income in 2010, almost 10 years ago now, was lower in Shannon County, South Dakota, where Pine Ridge is located, than in any other U.S. country, county. Uh, reports have the adult employment rate on the reservation somewhere between 70 and 80 percent. AIM, the American Indian Movement, and, and MEANS drew a lot of attention to the treatment of indigenous peoples in the U.S., but perhaps more than any other civil rights movement, its work remains unfinished. So, there's a lot to this, and there's there's a whole lot more to this standoff. That's the standoff in kind of light form. Um, if I dug into this a little bit more, there is so much here. Uh, the whole movement, the Wounded Knee Incident, began in February of 1973. It was these 200 Oglala... Oglala I've said that word a hundred times, and now I'm messing it up today. The Oglala Lakota and followers of the American Indian Movement seized and occupied this town of Wounded Knee. And they wanted to impeach the tribal president, Richard Wilson. Additionally, the protesters criticized the United States government's failure to fulfill treaties with Native Americans pe uh, American peoples and demanded the reopening of treaty negotiations. That's why AIM got involved. Some for the whole Wilson affair and his impeachment, but mostly to start petitioning the U.S. government. And we all know from history, and now this is in 1870, or 1973, which was 83 years after the original massacre at Wounded Knee. And so 71 days they held out, these activists, and they presented their case to the federal government. Um... We talked about who was shot there. Uh, Ray Robinson, a civil rights activist, joined the protesters, disappeared during the events, and is believed to have been murdered. Um, due to damage to the houses, the small community is not reoccupied until the late 1990s, or until the 1990s. Uh, the occupation attracted wide media coverage. I remember seeing this on the news, but being uninterested back when I was 12 years old, in 1973, I was more into Star Trek than anything else. Didn't like the news, didn't watch the news, didn't care about the news when I was 12. I only started getting a glimmering of this as I got older, an understanding of things. And so, you know, by the way, parents, if you're out there, teach your kids some history. Why don't you pick up a book like Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee? And there is a version that was written, an edition that was written for young people pick that book up and and read it to your kids. I do, let me ask you, do you spend any time reading with your kids? Do you spend time like that? I think it's a lost art in families. It's a totally different subject that I'm rabbit trailing on here. But I have, and you ask my 27-year-old twin daughters, my 18-year-old son, you ask them if we didn't read almost every night before bed. My son squirrely, didn't want to hear. My daughters became voracious readers themselves. They are now entrepreneurs and doing fantastically well. I attribute that to the fact that they were readers, in part. I have three little kids now, 10, 7, and 4, and I read to them as often as I can. My 10-year-old boy loves to have me read. We've read things like The Hobbit, uh, the classics. Uh, we read uh, um, Edgar Rice Burroughs' uh, John Carter of Mars, and while that was a novel and for entertainment when it was written, thicker language because it was written a hundred years ago. But my son loved that. And so he likes to have me read. Sometimes his seven-year-old daughter likes to have me read. The four-year-old could live without it. Eh, she's all over the place. She's a squirrel. So 
But read to your kids, and if you want to read something good to them, pick up Bury My Heart and Wounded Knee. Uh, pick up the kids' version or the, the young adults' version. It'll be easy to read. Give them this history, and it doesn't have to be just that book. Get them things that talk about our history. Uh, teach your kids. Most kids grow up with a, 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 an ambivalent view toward history. And I think that is on parents. Being good parents, we're going to instill those things in our kids. They don't have to love it, but you're the parent, and they are going to have to sit through it and learn it from you. Give them a chance. And why don't at your, while you're at it, be one of the many Americans that doesn't read that much and start reading. Read a little bit. Gain some knowledge. Pass that on to your kids. Do you know why these things about the Native Americans are little known? It's because nobody teaches them. But that is part of our history. So, the occupation attracted all this media coverage, uh, especially uh, after the press accompanied by the two U.S. senators from South Dakota, Two Wounded Knee, and the events electrified Native Americans who were inspired by the sight of their people standing in defiance of the government occupying their land. Can you imagine how some of these people lived? During uh, Wounded Knee, there were survivors of Wounded Knee who lived into the 1950s and the 1960s as elderly people. Their grandchildren and their, their children, their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren grew up with these stories living just a few years later. And so, at the time, there was this widespread sympathy for the goals of the occupation. Everybody, Americans were becoming more aware of this long-standing issue of injustice that was related to the Native Americans. And afterward, AIM leaders Dennis Banks and Russell Means were indicted on charges related to the events, but their 1974 case was dismissed by the federal court for, prosecutor, for prosecutorial misconduct. And it was a decision that was held up even on appeal. So Wilson stayed in office, the corrupt Oglala leader. Um, he was reelected in 74 amid charges of intimidation, voter fraud, and other abuses. The rate of violence climbed on the reservation as conflict opened between political factions in the following three years, and residents accused Wilson and his private militia, the Guardians of the Oglala Nation, the acronym was the, the Goons, the Goon Squad, uh, and uh, more than 60 opponents of the tribal government died violently during those years, including Pedro Bissonette, director of the Oglala Sioux Civil Rights Organization, OSCRO. So, there are some disputed facts in this. And according to former South Dakota Sen uh, Senator James Oberick, um, the U.S. Department of Justice sent out 50 U.S. Marshals to the Pine Ridge Reservation to be available in case of a civil disobedience. And this followed the failed impeachment attempt and meetings of the opponents of Wilson. Ames said that, he, that its organization went to Wounded Knee for an open meeting, and within hours the police had set up roadblocks, cordoned off the area, and began arresting people leaving town. And the people prepared to defend themselves against the government's aggressions. And by morning of February 28th, both sides were entrenched already. And so for years, these tribal tensions were going on. Now, this is internal, the tribal tension. But AIM used it to bring attention to the treatment of Native Americans in, de in general. And there's a whole slew of events we could go through almost day by day, week by week for what happened there. Um, but... Following the end of the 1973 standoff, the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation had a higher rate of internal violence. Residents complained of physical attacks and intimidation under the auspices of uh, Richard Wilson, their, their president, and his followers, the Goon Squad. The murder rate between March 73 and March of 76 averaged 56.7 per 100,000 per annum. That's 170 per 100,000 over the whole period. And Detroit had a rate of 20.2% 20 
in 74. So they were higher than Detroit. Uh, the trial of banks and means ended in appeal in 1975, and, and, it was, and it was dismissed totally, as it should have been. Um, there are so many references and so much further reading to do that uh, perhaps I'll post a list so you can see some of the things about this. So, folks, that was the modern-day wounded knee. Two Native Americans died. One U.S. Marshal was wounded and paralyzed. And it was all over 85 years later, still asking the U.S. government to honor its treaties with the Native American peoples. And with that, because I've used up so much time talking about everything up to this point, no more time left to, to do much fall down, uh, uh, falling action from this, other than to say thank you for being here. We'll talk about these things again. Next week, we're going to see if we can make it a little lighter around here, as it's been a heavy, heavy-handed, historical, emotional week on this show, which I love to do. I think it's important for us to be emotionally moved by some of these things, but to also learn the history. Thanks for being here. I'll see you again here on Monday, seeing as it's Friday now. So we're going to take a, a two-day break, and we'll be back. Thanks for being here. Good night. Sacred ground. Walk away from death to the land.